Hello and welcome back to Let's Code Physics. We are continuing to develop our quantum mechanical wave function evolver. Uh, we've successfully got a code that integrates the Schrodinger equation uh, and transforms the real part and the imaginary part of the wave function one step forward at a time. Um, so it's taking the, the Schrodinger equation in and of itself, directly solving that. Um, it's also calculating for us in the white curve here the uh, the modulus of the uh, wave function squared. Uh, so this is the probability density. So what you see as the thing moves back and forth is you're seeing the probability of where you would find the particle. Or if you like, uh, it's, if it's an ensemble of particles, if it's a whole like shower of particles going through this potential energy, then this is where you would find most of them, right? It's sort of this uh, little bell shape here. And we figured out that um, this thing is working correctly because when we put in these Gaussian shapes for a uh, for a harmonic oscillator potential, uh, then they just go back and forth, which is what you would expect for the uh, for the harmonic oscillator. Um, yeah, sure. Um, we've taken care of a lot of things. We've we've seen that the that the wave function stays pretty well normalized. We have to adjust uh, some of the parameters, you know, the time step and the spatial step, um, to make sure that it stays normalized. But that's working out pretty well. Um, <clears throat> You know, I mentioned taking some measurements earlier of, you know, a lot of different particles. So as in a quantum mechanics experiment, you don't measure the wave function itself. Uh, you measure properties that it determines. One of the most basic properties that it determines is the average location of all the particles or the average location of multiple measurements uh, on particles prepared in the same state. Uh, we call that average the expectation value. Um, the way expectation value works is that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an average, so it's sort of a weighted sum. Of course, the way a, a sum works when you've got something distributed like that is that it becomes an integral. Uh, we talked about earlier that uh, you've got to have the wave function normalized. Um, the idea behind the wave function being normalized is that the total area <clears throat> under the wave function times its complex conjugate has to equal one, right? So if you take up all the little pieces of area underneath the wave function, it has to add up to be one. It is cold season, so I'm drinking some uh, some herbal tea here. <clears throat> well, the way you calculate an expectation value <clears throat> is whatever the thing is that you're looking to calculate expectation of. So let's say you're looking for expectation value of something, of the square thing here. Uh, the way you calculate it is you take the integral of uh, again psi star and psi again psi is a thing psi and psi star are the, the the red and the green things that we're calculating or excuse me no S red the red part is the real part and the green part is the imaginary part so psi is red plus i green psi star is red minus psi green excuse me <clears throat> and basically what you do is you put whatever the um, you put whatever the, the, the measurable, the observable is in between them. You do the same type of integral and you see what number you get out. That is not necessarily going to be equal to one. Although the reason I bring back up the normalization is that this works out for normalization because if you make the square a one, then you can plug in a one here and you should get the average value of one. The average value of one should be one. And so that's where uh, uh, normalization is guaranteed by this expectation value calculation. So what we're interested in today is going to be the expectation value of x. So if you were to follow an ensemble of particles, what would be the average of the uh, of the position of all those particles? And again, it just follows the expectation value recipe, psi star x psi dx. Now the beautiful thing about this thing being x and not any weird operators like momentum, we'll get into momentum in another video, but momentum acts like a derivative, uh, is that you can pull that uh, x out here and then you just have the modulus squared of psi just like we've been calculating. So in order to calculate the wave function, or excuse me, in order to calculate the expectation value of x using this wave function, I can scroll down to here in the loop and I can add in a similar uh, integral like what I'm doing to calculate the normalization. Um, <clears throat> so here at the end, you know, we go to calculate the uh, we go to calculate the normalization. We start with an integral of zero, and then we add up tiny pieces. We take integral equals integral plus uh, the next piece, and then we multiply the whole thing by dx. So it's literally taking that integral and just turning it back into a summation. 
I can do the same thing here with the expectation value. Here I'm calling it exp x for expectation value of x. And basically we're doing the same type of loop. We're starting this thing at zero and every time we're adding, again, the, uh, the wave function modulus squared, but this time we're multiplying it by the x value. So this equation here, mirrors the integral that we have for the expectation value. So this expectation value that we have here, we've got x times sine modulus squared times dx. That's exactly what we've got here. We've got x times the sine modulus squared, and then eventually everything gets multiplied by dx at the end. And so we're gonna graph this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, so we'll graph the, the, uh, pos the expectation value, the position versus time. The, the reason we're particularly interested in this is a concept called Ehrenfest's theorem. Uh, Ehrenfest's theorem is really one of the most important things in quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, it doesn't make its way very prominently into the textbooks. I mean, it gets a bold thing and it gets a boxed equation, but you don't do a whole lot of problems involving it. But Ehrenfest's theorem says that as you take the expectation value of a physical observable in quantum mechanics, that expectation value should behave the same way that the variable does in classical mechanics. So let me show you what that means. For this case, remember we're dealing with a uh, with a with an x squared potential, so we're dealing with this u-shaped potential. If you put a classical electron in there, if you put an electron that obeyed the laws of classical mechanics in that potential energy, it's going to oscillate back and forth. In particular, it's going to oscillate back and forth in a sine or cosine pattern. So, Ehrenfest's theorem says if that's true in classical mechanics, then that should be true in quantum mechanics for the expectation value. So let's see what we get. We're going to run this code. We're gonna get the same animation that we've been getting down here. So we get our real and imaginary parts. Again, we've got this displaced Gaussian oscillating back and forth. So the expectation value, since this thing is a Gaussian, is actually the same as the location of the peak here. You can see that because this just went to zero, the expectation value, and this thing just passed through zero. This thing just reached negative a half. This thing reached negative a half and is coming back. And as I look at the shape of this expectation value, I can see that it's taking on the form of a cosine. It's technically negative cosine, but a negative cosine is still a cosine nonetheless. So this is a nice verification of Ehrenfest's theorem that, uh, that the expectation value of this thing should behave as if it were in a classical system. It's behaving like a cosine, hooray. <clears throat> things get more interesting when we make the state more interesting. So you remember we had these different displaced stationary states. Uh, so for example, this next one is the sort of first excited energy level. Uh, so we can expect things to get a little bit more interesting with that. So again, we've got the two uh, um, maxima here uh, because we've got a Gaussian multiplied by this linear function. So they are oscillating back and forth just like before. Um, only this time, the thing doesn't quite look like a sine curve, right? Because a sine curve doesn't have this little kink in it, right? Uh, and that's because this wave function has become more complicated, right? So um, we end up with this uh, with with this uh, uh, not sine pattern, but it's still oscillating, right? It's still oscillating back and forth. Uh, you could still give it a frequency, right? Because I could get you could give it a period from this peak to this peak, because it is repeating itself, just like classical mechanics would predict. Uh, it's just showing some interesting properties. So one of the ways you could test uh, whether classical mechanics or quantum mechanics held true would be to set up a harmonic oscillator system like this and then uh, give it the, the specified energy level that this thing has and see whether it comes out to still be a sine or cosine or whether it gets this little elephant trunk looking thing. Um, of course, things still get more interesting if I make this a more displaced, uh, uh, or not, not a more displaced, if I take this up another energy level, so this is now to the second excited energy state. Uh, so here we've got sort of the, the three stooges here, you know, marching back and forth from right to left, or left to right, and then right to left. And this thing gets even more interesting. So you see you get you, you get more complicated wave pattern the more uh, complicated your wave function is. In particular, we had one peak 
uh, in the uh, in the wave function before we had you know a nice cosine curve we had two peaks it was a cosine curve with a little kink in it now we've got the three peaks here and it's got these three peaks here so the 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 expectation value is sort of taking on whatever the 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 uh, level of complexity is that the uh, that the wave function has which is pretty cool um, and of course again it's repeating itself as something in a harmonic oscillator is going to do now of course these things are also still nicely behaved because they're stationary states of the harmonic oscillator they're going to maintain the same shape right so the white curve is maintaining the same shape so the yellow curve is being very nice and repetitious like this one's even got a little bit of a volcano uh, look to it uh, or the eye of Mordor yeah that might be the eye of Mordor Although actually this thing isn't quite repeating itself, is it? Because you look at the, the, the left bump here is bigger. It's getting smaller until here they're equal at Mordor. And here Mordor is getting a little lopsided. I guess it's um, it's it's crumbling at the end of the third film. Um, <clears throat> and then here you've got uh, you know an, an asymmetry down here. Here it becomes a little bit more symmetric. So you can see that you know maybe there's a little bit more going on to this thing than just three lumps. Uh, uh, marching back and forth and then of course we we made things even more interesting uh, by adding those three functions together but I want to show you first why we call these things stationary states to begin with right so it's a stationary state if it's a Gaussian that you center um, around zero uh, excuse me around x equals zero and I want you to watch this of what happens to the expectation value. Now I know it looks like this expectation value is curving because it is, but look at the scale of this thing, right? This thing is only moving by one part in a thousand. So if you were to zoom out on this thing a bit more appropriately, if you put this yellow graph with the other graphs, it's really not moving very much, right? It's only moving by the error associated with the computer of this thing not quite being a stationary state. Of uh, the slight rounding error on pi here and this and the well that's definitely a quarter and that's definitely dividing by two but you know this rounding error with pi you know uh, uh, you know accumulated error in the in the wave function and that'll be true no matter what state we give it so if we give it the second excited state as long as it's not displaced you know this change in the wave function is not going to be very appreciable I mean this one you know is the second excited state and it's only at 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2 so that's 0 0.015 you know compared to what were we getting before what was the I didn't take note of the range uh, let's see the type of range we were getting before was about a half so it's 0 0.15 out of a half which is not very much there we go <clears throat> So uh, we can, uh, let's see, let's take a look at what happens if we put in our sum of displaced stationary states. So we're going to uncomment all of these. So this is adding that first uh, displaced stationary state plus the second one plus the third one. So we're mixing three different energy levels here. So let's see what we get. First, remember we got this complicated behavior where the weight is kind of shifting back and forth. Um, so, so you can think of it as like there's a lot of probability to the left right now, then some probability moves to the middle, then most of the probability moves to the right. Well, that's reflecting the expectation value. The expectation value is moving from positive x through zero down to negative x. It moves back up to positive x, etc. Again, it's going to have a cyclic pattern because ultimately these things are going to be cyclical. And it's kind of cosine-like. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of a kink right here. There's a little bit of a vestige of that you know, extra lump from the uh, from the second excited state there, uh, but it's it's overall it's looking cosine like, so that's pretty cool. There is another interesting thing I can do with this. Uh, let's go back to uh, one of the simpler wave functions, not one of the stationary ones, one of the displaced stationary ones. Yeah, this middle one here ought to be fun. Um, what I can do instead of calculating just the expectation value of x, I can also calculate the expectation value of x squared. So for example, um, I could copy all of my information about calculating expectation value of x and instead make it expectation value of x squared. The reason you might want this is, um, uh, for example, if we were to calculate the expectation value of the momentum, which we'll do in a later episode, you can then confirm uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle by having um, 
by, by looking at the, the standard deviation in X and the standard deviation in momentum. And those two things are supposed to always, when you multiply those two things together, it's always supposed to be less than or equal to a constant. And so we can observe the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in action. Um, so far, the only thing I've done is change the name of the integral. All I have to do is square this X because again, it works the same way. The rule is whatever you want to put uh, in here, whatever you want to have the expectation value of, you just place in between these two. So if you want the expectation value of x squared, you just square the x here, which means you square the x here and square the x here. It's pretty cool how it works that way. Um, you could do expectation value of x cubed. Uh, and people don't generally do that. Things usually don't work with x cubed very much. Uh, and let's see what happens with the expectation value of x squared. Now this is not going to have as easy of a graphical interpretation in terms of uh, what's going on here. Uh, I, I initialize the thing to zero, probably should not have done that, but we'll just ignore that little vertical bump there. But you can see it behaves like this, uh, not quite like a sine or cosine, um, but then it gets these, you know, these, these dips or these kinks in it, kind of like what we had before. Um, and so it's really interesting stuff. So I'm going to leave that in there. Uh, what we will do in a future episode, it might be next week's or I might move on to some other potential energies next week. I'm not sure which. Um, but what we'll do in a future episode is uh, also calculate the expectation value of the momentum. And then we can do expectation value of momentum squared. And then we'll be able to do the uh, standard deviation in both. And we'll be able to get out the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for both. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I think I'm going to do that next week. So I'm going to delay moving on to other potential energies till we get this thing uh, uh, fully rocking with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.